Well, hello and welcome back to your next weekly instalment of Everlasting Summer. In the last episode, we rode the lovely ladies across the river, gathered some strawberries, and have been led on a an endless quest for weird things in weird places ever since. And the last one was we were sent to the uh, infirmary to get some yeast, and we left with a bottle of beer. I'm starting to like that uh, nurse more and more. I just wish I knew what colour her hair was. Okay. So. I hid the bottle under my shirt. And everything would have been fine, but Slavia called me, called out to me at the square. Actually, she sprang up from behind me so suddenly that I even gave a start. How's it going? What exactly? Your search for ingredients. Oh, so you know already. Yeah, I do. Slavia smiled. It's going all right. I answered, try not to give away my unrest. And what you have there? She pointed the bottle sticking out from under my shirt. Ah, this. She got me. Ah, it's nothing. I blushed with a silly giggle. <laughs> it's time to go. I was almost running, leaving the square with the puzzled Slavia behind. It's great that she is one of those people that don't ask unnecessary questions. But there are people in this camp who like nothing better than to poke their noses into other people's business. I don't know what you're talking about. Passing the pioneers' cabins, I stumbled upon Joanna. What are you hiding there? She gave one of her cheeky looks. I thought there was no point in denying anything, so I replied in a provocative manner. It's none of your business. I am a cipher officer bearing a message to headquarters. Well, that's certainly a big... message. I was carrying the bottle at waist height, so I was slightly embarrassed. Do you want some help? Perhaps I can make the swelling go away. I'll deal with it on my own, thank you very much. I walked past her confidently and proceeded on my way. To my surprise, she didn't say anything, nor try to pursue me. There was nobody at Olga's cabin, so I successfully managed to stuff the bottle under my bed. Once I got outside, I sighed with relief. Really, I couldn't believe that I would ever worry that much about a single bottle of beer. Really, uh, sorry, uh, like I was back in high school. It's a good thing it's safe now. Even if somebody finds it, I'll claim that it's not mine. I could always think of a suitable excuse from my enormous experience. Finally, it seems that everything had been collected. I took the hand cart with sugar outside and put the sack with the flour in it, followed by the two baskets of strawberries that somehow fitted in between. And the beer was hidden under my shirt, just in case. The day was coming to its end, so I had to hurry, as cake itself would need some time to bake. Of course, I'd rather enjoy lying down, closing my eyes, and getting a decent sleep. But I just couldn't let Olga down. Indeed, after all the trouble I'd gone to, I felt personally responsible for the success of this event. Coming to the square, I stopped for a moment to catch my breath. It wasn't that the cart was heavy, it ran smoothly without any noticeable effort required. It was just that any physical exertion caused pain to me now. Both a physical and a mental one. I sat down on the bench and closed my eyes for just a moment. What's that? I didn't really give a damn who it was. Probably just a fellow pioneer girl taking an interest in an unfamiliar companion in distress. What are you talking about? I asked her tiredly. She didn't reply. Those are ingredients for a cake. Do you like cakes? I don't know. What? You've never tried cake? I don't know. Obviously the girl didn't get what I was talking about. But it didn't surprise me at that moment. I really wasn't interested in the conversation. I was so tired that I had zero intention of classifying external distractions and tagging them as either common or uncommon. I see. 
Come down to the canteen later and have a bite. Really? Really? And what are they made of? What? I asked indifferently. These. Cakes. Well, some flour, some sugar, various fillings. Now that's a strange question. Doesn't she know what cakes are made of? And you have it all here? Yeah, sort of. And sugar? And sugar. Could you lend me a little? What for? I thought it was over the top. A sudden gust of wind made me grab the cart instinctively and open my eyes. However, nobody was there. Am I daydreaming? I noticed, though, that the sugar sack was untied and a small heap of it had poured out. Could it be that she was scared by the wind and ran away? Having fixed the sack, I got up from the bench and continued on my challenging strawberry way. There wasn't a single person near the canteen. No wonder dinner was still an hour away. I brought the handcart to the rear exit and handled the foodstuffs to the camp cook. She must have already been told what to do with them as she gave me such an unpleasant look. I'm not sure how long it takes to bake a cake, but it seems she had to hurry. I just wanted to relax for the remaining time up until dinner. In short, I was so tired that I just sat on the steps and waited. My eyes closed themselves. I guess I got so tired throughout the day that I didn't even notice how someone came up to me until they patted me on the shoulder. Hi. Miku was standing before me. Yeah. I didn't need a mirror to imagine the expression of skepticism and annoyance on my face. Oh, excuse me, I must have interrupted you. No problem, I was just sitting here. Ah, all right then. Miku beamed at me with a smile. I was just coming to dinner. I thought that it was time already, then it appeared to me that it's too early, but I decided to check in just in case. Maybe it's not me who's mistaken, but the clock is. Well, not the clock. Clock's not be mistaken. It's just that I misread it. She seemed to be ultimately confused now and fell so that silent. It's still about half an hour before dinner. Oh, that's great. I'll sit here and wait with you if you don't mind. Frankly speaking, I do mind. You know, I have some matters to attend to. I stood up quickly and left without saying goodbye, ignoring Miku as I always did while she screamed something after me. A minute later I got to the square and sat on the bench with a firm intention of finding a quiet and safe place to wait for dinner. I think this is the first time in the last four and a half days when I felt like this. I wasn't just irritated because of some insignificant details, but indeed I was really angry. I've completely stopped caring about where I am and why I'm here. I don't care about how to get out either. What's driving me mad is that I always have to carry out some stupid task given by our camp leader and it's always me who gets into stupid situations and sometimes even ends up looking like a clown. If all this is some alien trick or a plot of the universal mind they'd better consult with their psychiatrist. I gritted my teeth and clenched my fists. And the most annoying thing is that everything that happens seems to happen by itself somehow. I'd be happier not having to carry around bags of sugar that weigh a ton, but I had no choice at all. I mean, any other option would lead to much worse consequences than a muscle strain or hurt pride. Who are you angry with? Yolanda was standing in front of me and smiled slyly. Nobody really, I answered absently. But my fists gave me away. Just like that. Okay. Okay. It's up to you. You better tell me. Why did you run around the camp the whole day? with some kind of bags. I had to, I replied reluctantly. I guess it was food. Maybe it was. Yolanda was about to say something, but at that moment the bell rang, calling the pioneers for dinner. 
I sighed in relief and quickly headed to the canteen, leaving Yulana behind. Semyon, thank you very much. For what? The camp leader gave me a friendly smile. For the cake, of course. Ah, sure. It was at that exact moment that I understood the true meaning of the saying, Keep your thanks to feed your cat. If someone could explain that one to me, I'd be very grateful. Oh, yes, of course. Right, I think I get it. You didn't tell anybody. This ought to be a surprise. Yeah. That's my boy. And now, off you go to dinner. Olga waved her hand, pointing at the canteen. I stepped through the doorway slowly and started to look for a free place. It turned out there were plenty today, so I got the chance to eat all alone. There was fish with mashed potatoes for dinner. What misfortune once again, I'll be left half hungry. And didn't we have fish for lunch? Is it a fish only day today? Having pushed my plate with the fried sea dweller away, I laid my head on my hands and closed my eyes. But soon somebody came up to the table. Hey, you alright? I'm fine, I replied without changing my position. Just tired? Yeah, a little. It's bad. Slavia said it seriously. Of course. You remember that we are going for a hike after dinner, don't you? Have you prepared everything? What? Where? I opened my eyes and lifted my head up instantly. Lena was standing by Slavia. The hike! She was surprised. Didn't you know? No. I put my head down on the table and covered it with my hands. If only I could sink into the ground right away. The girls remained silent. I was left alone with my thoughts for some time and that was fine by me. Maybe I could have sat that way until the end of dinner time, but the strong voice of Olga was heard from the opposite end of the canteen. Guys, to celebrate the miraculous rescue of our friend and comrade Shurik, we bake this cake for you all. I lifted my head idly and looked towards the camp leader, but couldn't see anything beyond the pioneers' backs. A second, just a second. And nothing about me. Nothing about me rescuing Shurik or gathering the ingredients for the cake. As if that's how it ought to be. Well, it would be wrong to expect anything else from our camp leader. Let's go. Or we won't get our share. Slavia smiled. Let's go. Lena agreed. Yeah, sure. I got up reluctantly and tagged along behind the girls. As we approached the crowd of pioneers, Olga was just putting the cake on the centre of the table. And now... The camp leader wasn't able to finish as Yelena rushed out from the pioneer crowd and dived on t into the cake. She managed to nibble at it a few times a few before she was pulled away. She was kicking and screaming. I stared blankly from the outside of all this drama, Alyssa smiling, Lena picking up some cream with her finger, all the curious pioneers. I felt completely out of place here. I thought that if I closed my eyes now and opened the game, here I am back in the safety of my apartment in front of a computer. I blinked, but nothing changed. Only the noise and the confusion became sharper. Yolana, that's the limit. I... I just... Well, in fact, behaving like this was a bit over the top, even for her. Shurik broke into the con conversation, or... Is it a court-martial? Please, Olga, since the cake is celebrating my return, it's no big deal. He hesitated. It doesn't matter. The camp leader turned to Yolana. And you, today, I'm going to punish you to the fullest extent, so you'll behave next time. 
Whatever. She snorted and turned back. You won't be going on the hike with us tonight. As if I wanted to. I was more than willing to switch places with Yelana and skip the hike instead of her, but who knew? If I'd guessed beforehand, I'd have been the first one to go berserk and smash the damn cake. After a couple of minutes of confusion, the pioneers started to disperse. You'll have to get ready, too. There'll be a line-up in the square in half an hour. I looked straight into the eyes of the camp leader, trying to express my attitude non-verbally, but it seems that I failed. Don't be late. Yolana was sitting at the table when I approached her on my way to the exit. So why did you do it? She looked very upset. But she had the right to be so. I wanted to. Yolana replied abruptly. So you're happy now? Of course I am. Yeah, I'd see that face for slander. And you? Good luck with the hiking. She smiled mischievously, sprang up and rushed out of the canteen. Well, a little bit of luck wouldn't hurt. Walk and you shall reach. It was exactly this proverb that kept whirling in my head all the way down to the camp leader's cabin. Somehow, I just couldn't manage to argue, to pretend that I'm sick, or just to skip it without a reason. The events of this day taught me submissiveness. Although sometimes whatever was happening made no sense to me. As I walked in, I had a thought. Why isn't Tolga changing? Well, in fact, how should I get ready? Clothes. I only have an overcoat and a pair of jeans. Anyway, I forgot to ask whether it's going to be an overnight hike or not. I couldn't think of anything better, so I grabbed the sweater that I had on me when I arrived in the camp. The night might be fairly chilly, and shuffled slowly off to the square. The camp was already there, although it was about ten minutes before the time Olga had designated. I settled down near the edge and waited patiently. Night was falling. If viewed from the outside, what a fairly comical picture we would make. A, a crowd of pioneers lined up out of sheer habit like they were waiting a sign of command from the bronze gender. All this was happening in the scarlet rays of the sunset. And there he is, waving his hand and screaming attack! As roaring soldiers with red neckerchiefs charge into the battle against some ghostly enemy. But Olga showed up and started to talk instead of gender. It seems everybody is here. Great. I was so tired today that I couldn't even think about anything, so I ended up just listening to the camp leader. Now, today, we'll go hiking. It is essential for every pioneer to come and rescue his comrade, to offer a helping hand in the hour of need, saving them from a hopeless situation. We have to learn all these things together, and make sure that they never leave. A whisper ran through the, the pioneer crowd, suggested that most probably the, the truly epic expedition would end up in a clearing in the forest, several hundred feet away from the square. Somehow I thought so too, otherwise it would be leaving. We'll walk in pairs, so if you haven't chosen a partner for yourself yet, now is the right time to do so. Pioneers quickly caught on to the idea and started to match in pairs. It looked like I was the only one without a partner. Slavia was enthusiastically discussing something with Olga. Lena was with Miku. Electronic was, of course, with Shurik. Well, it might not be a bad idea to go alone after all. Semyon! The voice of the camp leader pulled me out of my thoughts. I went up to her reluctantly. I see you haven't found a partner. Seems like it. Then you'll join Genya. She is alone too. 
I was struck with that special kind of despair which only a true loner can experience. So it appears that I am left with a prickly librarian that I wouldn't risk spending a couple of hours with even if I was paid to. Although we both seem to be in the same boat now. I slowly approach Jenya, chair in one hand, whip in the other. Well, I guess we'll be going together. She looked up at me. <sighs> I don't even think that I'm glad, said Jenya seriously. Why on earth you should feel glad? I asked naively. Oh, never mind. It would be much better if you just shut up. Ah, uh, it couldn't get any better than this. She turned her back on me and followed the other pioneers. I still hadn't seen any special reason to walk in pairs. Anyway, we were walking on the well-trodden forest trails, and it would be quite difficult to get lost here, even if I wanted to. Moreover, while we'd already been hiking for half an hour, we weren't rushing into the depths of the forest, trying to face all the dangers that could test our courage and harden our pioneer spirits, but instead were just walking around in circles. However, if we take into account that Olga was our chief, this hike could be compared to a hobbit's march from the Shire to Mordor. Mordor. Just as Jenya insisted, I was following her at a distance in silence. The librarian seemed to be perfectly okay with it. Hey, don't you know when we'll reach our destination? Oh, what? Um, the place where we'll settle down and set up camp? The whole point of this hike isn't to set up camp, but the hiking itself. You just don't get it. Yeah, it seems that I don't understand a thing about hiking. I guess you're right, but still. I don't know. She replied sharply and quickened her pace. I caught up with her and asked, Listen, why are you always so... I was about to say mean, but stopped short. I haven't done anything bad to you, and I'm not going to. She glared at me in surprise. Why oh, so what? Well, unsociable, kind of. Or is it something about me? Oh, God, that stupidity out already. Mm, as you wish. I decided not to start a conversation with her for the rest of the hike. At last, Olga decided to end this Sisyphean toll. It's time to halt. The place chosen turned out to be a quite large glade with a few tree trunks laid in a half circle to make an improvised arbor with the remains of, the, of a campfire in the middle. Obviously such hikes are a tradition in this camp. I was sent to gather firewood, of course, with the other boys. It didn't take long because there were a lot of branches and logs of various sizes lying around. Eventually, Olga lit the fire using some old newspapers. I was eager to know what was written there, but couldn't discern anything other than the Soviet symbols. Pioneers took their places on the fallen log benches and started to talk about things. It seems that the, fi the final goal of this event had been achieved. The only things missing were a pot of fish soup, aluminium cups of vodka, and a guitar. Uh, yeah, that works for me too. But... I wouldn't be surprised if all those would appear somehow. What are you thinking about? Slavia sat next to me. Oh, nothing special. Just enjoying the hike. I answered sarcastically. You don't look too happy. Well, I'm not to jump. I'm not about to jump for joy. Sorry about that. Okay, I won't disturb you. She sat with me for a while, but after realizing that I wasn't in the mood. For uh, in the mood of talking, she left me to enjoy my introspection all alone. All I wished for was to lie down in bed and fall asleep as soon as possible, but I was being surrounded by smoke and the useless chatter of pioneers around me instead. They were cheering and laughing and in general enjoying this warm summer evening. 
In the far side of the glade, I noticed Lena was arguing with Alyssa intensely. Intensely and Lena seemed like complete opposites to me. Slavia had left to go somewhere after our conversation, it seems. Electronic and Shurik were, snor uh, were trying furious to pr prove something to Olga. Looks like I'm the only one that doesn't belong here. And I think on this decision we will end it and pick this one up next week. So, I hope you've enjoyed this. I have. So until the next time, I have been Simon Parsons. This has been Everlasting Summer. Thank you and good night.